Thank you. Uh, being a uh, former elected public official, I'm always conscious of who's recognized and who's not. And uh, I know that we did miss some, but there's one person in particular who I worked with for 18 years and was responsible for keeping me on track, and that's Council Member Lisa Herbold. So she was, I want to make sure I recognize her. <clears throat> Uh, I also want to thank, and by the way, raise your hand if you don't hear me, because sometimes my voice gives out and I'm soft, so, or just yell. Um, uh, I want to thank my publisher, uh, Sasquatch Books, for providing uh, the, donating those books for those who make a contribution of $250 or more. Um, thank you for making that contribution, and if you do make it and get the book, if you have some time, crack it open and see what you think. Uh, I, um, I, wrote, I wrote this book basically because um, I believe activi activism begins by noticing things that uh, we have ignored or taken for granted. And that at some given point, they just don't seem right. It's asking ourselves, like Rosa Parks did, why am I sitting in the back of the bus when I could be sitting in front? And thoughts like that spark movements. Um, so how do we spark the inquisitive mind? I think it begins by questioning the status quo. Is it serving our needs, our family's needs, our neighbor's needs, and our fellow citizen's needs? And at this point, let me define citizen because, as you may know, it's become a hot term lately. Um, a citizen is anyone who lives in this country and is contributing to our democratic society. It's not, it's not just a piece of paper, and it's not running through bureaucratic red tape. And having a big bank account should not allow someone to cut to the front of the line to enter this country as a citizen. And certainly, it's not based on the color of one's skin, or the religion they practice, or whether they have a religion at all. Now, a quote from all people, the conservative Republican senator, Lindsey Graham, summed up what being an American was all about. After President Trump had finished railing in the Oval Office in front of a bunch of um, Republican leaders, sharing what seemed to be white nationalist thoughts, who would have thought? Senator Graham spoke up. He looked directly at President Trump and told him bluntly, America is an idea. It's not a race. So what is that idea? I came across a quote that's almost uh, 30, 75 years old now from Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union Address. He said, the republic grew to its present strength under the protection of certain political rights. Among them, the right of free speech, the right of free press, and free worship. Then, he went on to say, as our nation has grown, as our economy has expanded, and these political rights have proved inadequate to assure us equality. We have come to a clear realization of the fact that the true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. He was adding a fourth freedom, the freedom from want. And recognizing that freedom, I believe, is at the heart of this nation's current political struggles. It goes beyond debating how many beds we can afford to provide for homeless people. It goes beyond expressing sympathy for the most vulnerable amongst us. It comes down to Americans having to decide what kind of freedoms are most important to us. Is it the freedom from want? or the freedom to accumulate wealth, often without restraint. Since 1977, we have seen 
of our national wealth as measured by the gross domestic product. Transferred from middle class working families to the top 1% of the population. That trend cannot sustain a functioning and responsible democratic government. Now, this is not a new debate. We've had it actually for over 100 years in this country, but I think it's now reaching a crescendo. And we're seeing it playing out in the Supreme Court and in our court system in general. And the reason we're, we are now relying on the court system is that because the other two branches of government under both political parties have already been lax and have allowed the highest concentration of wealth this nation has ever seen. Now, in seeking a path forward, I'm not necessarily talking about socialism or capitalism, and I'm not talking about class warfare. But I am talking about what a democratic society needs so that people do not give up hope in our system of government. So that citizens do not seek solace in cynicism or embrace the false security in believing a demagogue's accusations on who was responsible for their problems. And unfortunately, we can see that happening today. The first, with the decline of voter turnout, which hopefully will be reversed this fall. And usually those, voted, those not voting are those who have the most to lose from being unrepresented in government. And the second trend is this explosion in conspiracy theories that blame the weak and those who have the least political power. And we see them coming off the internet almost every morning and unfortunately too often echoed by the White House. The effects of a shrinking middle class on the national stage are now well documented. I won't go through the statistics, but the general picture is people now are working longer hours, multiple jobs, and often both, having poor health. Our health has declined faster than any other of the developed democracies in this country, in the world. And when they are too old to find work or be able to work, they are left with a minuscule savings set aside for retirement. For instance, the median family, the median savings for all U.S. families is just under $5,000. Think about that. And according to a 2016 survey, right, not even two years ago, 35% of all adults have only several hundred dollars in their savings account. And they are better off than the 34% who have zero in their savings account. Closer to home in Seattle, we are witnessing the decline of the middle class or the flight from Seattle and the growth of the poverty class. It can happen to anyone who is barely able to pay for their basic necessities. And according to the King County All Home website, the leading cause of someone becoming homeless is losing their job. Now, out in the hallway, we have a great exhibit of a number of myth busters that describe the population of people who are homeless. But I consider all of those wrapped up in the grand myth that homelessness is someone else's problem. For too many people, it only becomes their problem when they find tent cities and homeless campsites in neighborhoods they had never experienced them before. You know, I travel around, visit a number of cities, and Seattle is not the only place witnessing this horrendous condition. We see poverty expanding because a dominant national political philosophy says the freedom to protect marketplace investments is more legitimate than protecting the economic welfare of our citizens. If you read the literature on what a good portion 
hopefully, I mean, hope, not hopefully, unfortunately, the majority of the members of the Supreme Court believe in, that's where their thoughts are. The response to this mindset should not be simply spending more money to provide social services or even affordable housing. Those are good things. They need to happen. We need to do that. But if we just go down that path of only providing services and not altering the laws, you will end up arguing about the burden of taxes and the management or mismanagement of government, which is exactly what the objections that were raised for opposing the head tax on the largest Seattle businesses in order to provide affordable housing. Even though less than 2% of all Seattle businesses would have contributed anything to that tax. That is why I believe we need to go beyond just treating the damaging effects of this dominant theory, philosophy. We must change the expectations that our fellow citizens have for our nation so that we have a society that we want to live in and can afford to live in, a society that provides the economic security that FDR referred to, and the people in this room and thousands of others beyond this hall have shown that we can change our laws to create not a perfect society, but one that is certainly more just and a more equitable one. Seattle has had victories, and they have been adopted in states in both blue and red states. They have taken root because citizens realize that they have more in common with protecting the public welfare than protecting the power and the wealth of the few. Now, Seattle has begun that effort by adjusting the structure of our, of our economy so that people will gain some stability in their lives. So they have an opportunity to reach the American dream of economic independence and not not be dependent on government. Now let's identify a few significant steps that Seattle has taken toward that goal in just two areas. Improving working conditions and increasing rental security. Both have made Seattle more affordable for those who are in the middle to bottom half of family incomes. They are not final solutions, but they are real and they are long lasting changes. With regards to working conditions, we, see, we have set a national standard by gradually moving to a $15 minimum wage for all employees in Seattle. We listened to all sides, but we did not retreat from this objective. And as a result, thousands of lower paid part-time workers can now better manage their financial burdens. We also adopted one of the most progressive paid sick leave ordinances in the nation, which allows sick employees to stay home or stay home and take care of their sick children, still receive pay, and not be under the threat of losing their job. In the area of rental security, we passed a rental registration and inspection ordinance that basically allowed for extensive public involvement in writing it. And inspectors now will make sure that all registered properties comply with minimum housing and safety standards. This will preserve the quality of life for renters in all neighborhoods throughout the city. And afterwards, we passed a tenant protection law to guarantee that rental units are fit for habitation before a landlord increases rents. According to a 2009 American survey, approximately 10% of our rentals have moderate to severe physical problems. And to assure that both these sets of improvements have been made for the labor side, we established an office of labor standards. Without enforcement, you have no change. And for the side of rental security, we established a renter's commission. And it's important to listen to renter's concerns because what we have seen in Seattle through rising rents is that we are now the third largest homeless population in the US according to Zillow. And that by absolute number. If you were to look at it per capita, we'd be by far and away the highest. 
passing these laws show we are not helpless. We do not have to wait for Congress to act. Here in Seattle and other cities, there is an urban movement to, bro- to provide for our freedom from want, to stop more people from sliding into a state of homelessness. But what does it take? Persistent work, innovative solutions, and above all, a commitment to be engaged in our democracy. But isn't that why we're all here this morning? To be citizen activists? To hear that bell of freedom ring for all of us? Thank you.